I am a guy that is obsessed with building the objects of his imagination. I'm a guy who is constantly recording his uh, vibrations, his observations, or his emotions through drawings, sculptures, video projects, and epic collaborations. But in the end, I think I'm a guy that is just searching for the best way to live my creative life. And as you might imagine, things started out super slow. Um, no one told me early on that I needed to be thinking outside of the box, or the bucket, I guess. Um, that's when I heard about a job as a cookie decorator. Brushes, edible paints, free cookies. It was amazing. My mind, my imagination was beginning to imagine on an unimaginable new level. I thought if I could make cookies, which, which make and decorate cookies with such skill, perhaps I could get into construction. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but I'd taken the first major step into the world of object building. I had imagined something, I had drawn that thing, and then I had built that thing. Soon though, the bottom fell out of that market. Uh, the top and the sides kind of fell out too. And um, so I talked with a couple mentors that had been helping me, and they thought I should improve my social network, uh, maybe learn to read. <laughs> so I experimented with school on and off for the next 20 years. Uh, looking back though, I think in school what I really learned was how to speak better visual. Uh, sure, I read some fiction, I learned some facts, I improved my social IQ, but I never stopped drawing. I was learning to confidently print my imagination. And I would encourage all of you to, to speak more visual. Maybe today, take some notes in the form of pictures as opposed to words. Think about your ideas in the forms of colors and shapes. Scribble more. All of my high-level research indicates that obsessive drawing helps lead to a creative life. <laughs> it's true. Another thing I think I learned was that a good idea only comes while you're working on a bad idea, and that you just have to get started. That's, that's the most crucial thing. You just must get started. Nothing's going to happen while you're flipping channels. You have to get started. I built 20 or 30 cameras that had no idea how to take a photograph. <laughs> I've built heaps of musical instruments that never played a note of music. I, built, I hand built a city for four million people this big. <laughs> I'm not sure any of these ideas were all that great, but I got started. Many of these projects have ended up leading to commercial jobs. Uh, one I'd like to share with you today is uh, I got approached by this big Hollywood hotshot mouse and he wanted me to uh, help him sell his TV channel. So just getting started leads to projects like that. Uh, another form of making that I'm extremely passionate about and has taken up really the last maybe five years of my life, uh, uh, it's really taken over, is uh, this idea of making things with people who normally wouldn't make things. People that don't think of themselves as creatives. Um, people that are maybe in an office all day and you, I, I just try to get scissors and glue in front of them and just see what happens. Um, this is actually, uh, the other thing is that every project is different. The only thing that really changes is that everyone is invited. Uh, this is actually a shot of Southwest, or the South Island Field Notes, uh, which is right down the street. Here's another shot. I think we had 700 people show up over the course of three days, and I got everyone to think about the beauty of this island and just be inspired by it and just make. I also get a chance to do these projects with more skilled makers or art students. Uh, this prairie schooner was built in five days with 220 people. 
in Ogden, Utah. This yacht was made in six or seven days with 30 people. There's a fantastic video on my site about this. I also took that idea to the skies recently and um, got, I think it was 280 people in seven days we built this plane. All I really wanted was a plane, but once the art students started getting inspired by each other, I was able to step back and things got built that I never could have possibly imagined. The cockpit was fully equipped with all the latest dials. Whoa, you guys like that? with all the latest dials and switches and levers and buttons that you could possibly imagine. We had gauges to monitor the gauges that were monitoring our gauges. <laughs> Nothing could go wrong. So I strapped into my flight vest and I took off on a maiden voyage. Everything was going pretty good what, too until mechanical failure or the lack of an actual engine forced me to crash land through the skylight into this gallery where I just happened to have a drawing show up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought, maybe I could test pilot my way to a creative life. So I wrote a few letters, <laughs> and before you know it, I was training to be an astronaut. <laughs> Soon I was underway, underway with the construction of my new craft, and it too had all the latest technology available. I started the engines, and I learned to fly her. But that ship didn't run quite so well. I thought, if I could find a group of people that had done a bit more research than me, if I could find a group of people that actually knew how to do math, then, then maybe I could have a better potential of uh, achieving my creative life in space. So with the help of retired astronaut Nicole Stott, 700 science teachers, and the help of the NASA Houston Space Center, um, and all the kids and families that showed up that week, we created the world's largest space fleet, or star fleet in the galaxy. And I think the best looking as well. Here's a video. That was a fun one. And there's a longer form video on my website if you're interested in that project. The technology that I was exposed to at NASA had my mind spinning. And before you know it, I was working on my first laser. <laughs> Things got a little bit out of hand, as you can tell. I ended up catching the house on fire. And then while trying to put that out, I nearly killed myself. <laughs> Got a little bit of a scar still from that, actually. But I, had, I was learning to, I was going to learn to use this tool for my selfish gain. I was going to use this laser to achieve my creative life. And before you know it, I had the director of the Long Beach Art Museum convinced that, <laughs> that my work was going to be the best work for the next show. <laughs> the last project I want to share with you is another mega super collaboration, I like to call them, or collaborative super jam. Um, I was lucky enough to work with a school, uh, K or kindergartners through high school, through 12, so we were working with six-year-olds all the way up to 18-year-olds, and I wanted to get everyone to work together to build one world. So I had kindergartners cutting cardboard fringe and painting it green to make it grass. I had first graders and second graders making flowers and fence posts. 
I had third and, and fourth graders making telephone poles and mailboxes. Um, we had sixth and seventh graders making buildings. We had the eighth and ninth graders helping those sixth and seventh graders at details of the buildings. And then the upper school designed cars, trucks, and caravans. And then I uh, enlisted the help of uh, Roger TV, some good friends of mine in LA. And they came out and we brought this world to life. The project's not finished yet, but I want to share with you, share with you a teaser. <laughs> larger lesson here. How do we make things? We let ourselves go, we provide the tools, we unplug, and we reconnect. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.